This is Jonah Hobson. I'm the marketing manager at ITI, and welcome to the Showcase Webinar Series. Today's webinar is titled Ground Bearing Pressure, Practical Applications for Lifts of All Sizes. We're really, really, really lucky to have a guest presenter with us today, um, Jim Jato. Jim is the heavy lift and rigging planner with Buckner Heavy Lift Cranes. And of course, we have your host, Mike Parnell, on the line as well. Uh, for, 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 for folks joining us for the first time, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to ITI before handing, over, handing things over to Jim and Mike. Okay, so ITI is an education organization, specifically crane, rigging, and lift management training, with the core of what we do being courses at client locations and then our three state-of-the-art training centers in Woodland, Washington, Memphis, Tennessee, and Edmonton, Alberta. We have trainers based in the United States, Canada, and currently Brazil as well. Our instructors have educated clients on crane rigging activities that span really a number of industries. The need to lift, move, or hoist an important or heavy load is pretty universal across all heavy industry. So one of our instructors might be training on an offshore platform in the Gulf of Mexico one week and then turn around and have a course at an open pit mine site in western Canada the next week. When you think about that, that's, that's really pretty cool and I'm sure it plays a huge role in, in keeping all of our instructors fresh and engaged and really, really passionate about what they do. So we're really proud to have worked with some of the world's best companies. All the logos you see on the slide there these companies have found something that they're really, really, really good at, and it allows them to be successful. So the fact that they defer to ITI as the subject matter experts when it comes to cranes, rigging, and lifting, it really speaks volumes about the technical know-how we have within our organization. So if you're here, you're in the Showcase webinar series. Many of you have been here before. It's, it's a monthly webinar that will always be free that we put on to help educate and better the industry. You can see a number of our past showcase webinar topics on the screen there. And uh, if anything jumps out at you, they are available at the ITI showcase webinar archive, which can be accessed via iti.com slash webinars. Um, really briefly, I'm going to have Zach Parnell, he's the Vice President and CEO of ITI, jump in really quick with a, spe a special message. Hey everybody, uh, Zach here. Pleasure to, uh, well I don't get to see you all, but I was just joking with Jim, me and him go way back to last month in Houston where we uh, met for the first time, but he was explaining to me uh, about this calculator and this software basically he wrote that he's going to show you guys today. It's pretty unreal. Um, that's, what, that's why I invited him to come speak on this thing. The reason we, just, we started that discussion and this webinar, uh, we, we had talked about a rigging engineering program at this Houston event we had last month. It was our uh, kind of our advanced rigging and lifting workshop. Um, but we have this new, if you haven't heard about it yet, this new program coming out called Fundamentals of Rigging Engineering. And there's, I tell you, there's really nothing else like it in the industry. There's, um, it's very, very high level, uh, and we have some of the some of the leading engineers in the field uh, involved guys from Keith Anderson from Bechtel and Marco Van Dahl, David Dewar, Ron Koner, et cetera. I, I just want to encourage you all, because Jim, his presentation today is going to touch on uh, this sort of subject, uh, one subject of many that can be found in the rigging engineering program. And I think this webinar, we'll, we'll either make this webinar an optional resource in that program, or we might actually just have Jim do a complete uh, little lesson on it that's more that has assignments and more uh, engagement. But um, I'm really happy again to have Jim here, and thank you for uh, Jim and uh, Buckner for spending the time because uh, I tell you this is going to be very good. So I'll, I'll I'll finish up the introductions. Most of you, if you've been on before, you know uh, Mike is our uh, president and CEO. He's really our technical director as well um, on the ASME B30 and P30 committees. And uh, a little bit about Jim, he, he, this slide says he's a newcomer to the heavy lift industry, but within, I think within three months of being in the industry, something like that, Jim, I forget, you told me you developed this software, uh, which is very incredible. I think he's based out of, um, Jim, you based out of North Carolina? 
Uh, yes, that's Graham, North Carolina, where our headquarters are. Yeah, that's right. So he's doing all sorts of heavy lift uh, crane planning, and he's going to go over really in detail today about ground bring uh, pressure. So, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. I think you and Jonah practiced this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to make you presenter now and uh, take it away, buddy. All right. Thank you very much, Zach. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, briefly, as, as Zach pointed out, it was on the previous slide. Oh, did my, is my screen blank currently? It is, yep. Jim, yeah, this is Mike Parnell. How are you, buddy? Doing well. How about yourself? Great. Yeah. Okay, now we've got a, a mini slide and there we're ready. ready. Yep. Okay, great. So, as was mentioned on the previous slide, I am fairly new to this. I've only been at this for about three years, and um, I'm going to mention real quick the company that I was with previously, it was a bit of a trial by fire. I had never heard of lift planning about two weeks before my first critical lift plan was executed, um, and that was in an oil refinery. So it was a, an uphill battle trying to teach myself, and luckily teaching myself is one of the things that I think I'm best at, and this is where all of this comes from, is teaching myself about the industry and how these lifts work. Um, before I go any further, I want to say um, immense thank you to ITI. Uh, first of all, for the rigging conference in Houston, that was extremely uh, worthwhile to go to. I uh, felt like I learned a lot and had a great time um, meeting new people in the industry, uh, particularly from uh, ITI. And um, an additional thank you to Klaus Meisner and Mike Walsh for the two previous ground bearing pressure uh, related webinars. Um, I watched those in preparation for this, and I think that the two of them combined really lead up to this presentation very well because they talked a lot about what causes cranes to tip and the ground bearing pressure preparations that need to be done and how to figure out what is an allowable pressure for a given area, but not how to calculate for a crane once that information is there. Um, now, I want to outline first before we go on two the, the two audiences that I kind of had in mind when I prepared this, the first being people who are into lift planning, such as myself, who may still be starting out just in the same way that I did uh, and kind of learning their way through it um, and may not know to take a look at variables such as this to really get an answer that is accurate to what's going on beneath the crane mat. Um, and secondly, th the audience that I'm also shooting out for is people in oil refineries, nuclear power plants, the kinds of people who have to review lift plans and need to know what to look for. Um, and I'm going to point out quite a few things that I think really should be included in every lift plan. And quite often, um, I, I would find them missing in other people's plans, not that they didn't, not that they left them off intentionally, but they may not have known. And to be honest, when I first started out, I did not know some of these things were necessary. So um, I'm going to overview what to put in for the lift planners and what to ask for the reviewers. Um, and I'm going to bring up some things that I still see that aren't necessarily as thoroughly scrutinized as I would like to see. Um, sometimes they're not necessarily dangerous things, but you can let certain things slide through the cracks if you're not careful. So I'm going to start off with a brief introduction to Buckner companies. I've been working for Buckner for about a year and a half now. Um, but Buckner has been around since 1947 and began as a steel erection company. We still do steel erection to this day, but as our projects grew, so did the uh, size of the cranes we needed to purchase. And uh, we branched off into crane rental, as well as industrial rigging and miscellaneous fabrication. Uh, we hold several high rankings for total size of our fleet uh, in lift capacity, larger, you know, larger crawler cranes for both American crane and transport and international crane and transport. Uh, we're also ranked fairly highly for steel erection. I uh, just want to give you a quick look at our fleet and what I have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, you notice real quick, every single thing on that list is a crawler crane. We definitely specialize in crawler cranes. Um, most of our people here have had a background almost strictly in crawlers. So we're really the experts when it comes down to this uh, because this is what we live and breathe every single day. Um, and one quick announcement about this list. Uh, previously, 
The LR1750 was our largest capacity crawler crane. Uh, if, for any of you who may have been at Con Expo, if you saw the new LR11000 at the Liebherr booth, we now own that machine. Um, it is currently on the way to its first job, and we're extremely excited about that. Um, we purchased it with the P-boom attachment, which you see in the model right there, uh, which essentially takes luffing jib sections to build the main boom in two pieces, and then main boom pieces to build a heavy luffing jib, and vastly increases capacity up to 1,433 U.S. tons. So I'm extremely excited about that. We're just about to get started with some lift plans uh, for the first job, so definitely something we're looking forward to. Now, this is the reason, and, and I'm sure all of you have seen these pictures by now. To me, this picture really identifies the reason why I feel this is extremely important. And it, it, groundbreaking pressure used to be the sort of thing that used to be overlooked in many cases, as it was overlooked here. Um, it's, it's a tragic thing to think that people lost their lives because of um, something that wasn't really an accident, as the Lee Bear representative pointed out who wrote the scathing letter in response to this, this was not an accident, it was foreseeable, which makes it not an accident. So, um, again, we've all seen these pictures. The crane was not on any actual mats. It was on some sort of... Jim, it sounds like we lost you there. Not nearly enough to compensate for your massive... Um, not nearly enough to compensate for the massive weight of that machine. So real quick, uh, for anyone not, who hasn't heard about the specifics, it was a 102 uh, meter main boom LR11350 with 42 meters of derrick and a ballast tray. Uh, when considering the load, it was 2,185 tons gross crane weight, uh, which came out to 39 tons per meter square. And beneath the tracks, that comes out to nearly 8,000 pounds per square feet. Now, I've, I've been lucky enough to work in a pretty wide variety of places in my short career, but I have never been anywhere that was even close to 8,000 pounds per square feet allowable. In fact, the highest I've been in was 4,000. So we can see that there was an extreme level of carelessness here, especially since you can see mats in the picture, and reportedly there were steel plates available on site. So. It, was, it could have been carelessness, laziness. It may not have been in the plan to begin with. Um, but one of the quotes that I've read online from one of the foremans was the 11350 was only working at 82% of the load chart. Um, Klaus and Mike pointed out very well in their, in their previous pre uh, presentations that the crane is only as strong as the ground it's standing on. Um, you can be a fantastic weightlifter, but if you're lifting on thin ice and that thin ice can't hold you, it doesn't matter how strong you are. So. This is why this is important to me because I see lots of accidents online that could have been prevented with some very simple preparation. Now, this is a bit of a preview of what Zach was referring to, uh, what I've developed. Um, and I just ran the numbers real quick on the situation uh, down in Brazil that we just saw the pictures of. And had they simply put four foot by 20 foot by one foot thick hardwood mats of reasonable strength, they could have gotten almost down to 3,000 pounds per square foot. And the, I know the site conditions were a little bad that morning. Uh, a lot of the reports were that it had been raining, but nearly 3,000 is much, much better than nearly 8,000. So uh, we're going to get into how this all works and what all the numbers on the screen mean so that we can better understand how these things need to be calculated. So I'm going to tell a quick story because this is where this all started for me. Um, I was involved with a job at an undisclosed location that I cannot reveal because the job is still ongoing and we are not allowed to reveal anything about it. Um, it was with an LR1750 and they had a very unusual rule that you could only assume that an area two feet beyond the edge of the tracks in all directions was actually bearing the load of the crane. They also had an astonishingly low allowable ground bearing pressure of 2,000 pounds per square feet. So if anyone out there has ever worked with an LR1750 fully loaded with counterweight, it's nearly impossible to get under 2,000 with just two feet beyond each edge of the tracks. And I argued this until I was blue in the face. Um, because of two logical fallacies you see here, I mean, in the top one, the top example of one additional mat all centered up on the center of the tracks, 
um, the edge of the tracks don't reach the full four foot length or width of the mat. And everything that I've been taught and seen myself, it says that the tie bars holding the timbers of the mat together are not meant to transfer load between the timbers. So if you're only putting weight on the front timber, those final three aren't receiving anything. But they still told us, no, 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 you can still go two feet beyond. Well, that made no sense. And it made even less sense in the bottom picture. Uh, this is another hypoth hypothetical situation I presented them with. Well, if we're going two feet beyond the front and the rear, what if the crane is sitting like this, where the two feet beyond the front and the rear extend beyond the mats that are even physically there, and they still would not relent. So this is where I began to realize that there's something up, and I need to figure out exactly how these mats are behaving beneath the tracks when applied to the immense pressures beneath these heavy lift cranes. So did a little searching online, and this is the source of the equations behind the calculator that I've developed. And uh, credit needs to be given where credit is due, absolutely. Uh, David Dewar, PE, uh, met him a few times. He's a very, very uh, brilliant man, uh, excellent public speaker. I've enjoyed every lecture that I've ever seen of his. And uh, he came out with this article that really gets to the bottom of the math behind what the mat is doing when placed under pressure on, a, on soil. If anyone out there has not read this, I highly recommend it. All you need to do is Google effective bearing length of crane mats, and his uh, article will be the first result. It's only seven pages. It might take you quite a while to get through it because it's quite dense, but um, it is excellent information. And what I've done is I use two sets of principles that he mentions in the article, uh, calculating the mat length based on soil bearing capacity and the mat length based on mat strength. So I'm going to get into what those mean first, just as an introduction. So let's say you're at a job site, and for sake of argument, we're going to use a crane with an outrigger here, and you're told you have a certain allowable limit. So to begin with, we take the outrigger load, the amount of the pounds of force being put down, plus the weight of the mat, and divide that by the actual allowable ground bearing pressure. That's Equation number one. That gives you the actual area of the mat required. Uh, equation two is simply dividing the area required by the width of the mat to find out how long the mat needs to be in order to fully satisfy that ground bearing pressure. Um, equation three takes what you can see down in the bottom, the LC, the uh, cantilevered length of the mat. It's essentially how far beyond the edge of the outrigger, or in my case, crawler uh, pad, does the mat need to extend to satisfy the ground bearing pressure requirements? Equation five calculates the, the um, bending moment in the mat. Six then compares it to the maximum allowable bending stress. Seven calculates the shear in the mat. And then eight calculates the, allowable, the actual shear stress versus allowable. As long as you are able to reach below your allowable ground bearing pressure and satisfy equations six and eight, to stay below your allowable shear and bending, you found a mat accommodation that will work for what you're trying to achieve. Now, the mat length based on mat strength is slightly different in that it requires a lot of iterations to get correct because the L effective that you see in the very first equation, you have to assume at first. And then you run through the equations essentially the same as previously, and you must satisfy equations 12, 14, and 15. 12 is the bending stress, make sure you're below the allowable. Uh, 14 is the shear again, and then if those work out and you're still below your ground bearing pressure, then you have another effective mat solution. Now, the reason it's iterative is because even if you find uh, a an effective length that works, you may find that you're well below what your allowable bending and allowable shear are, so you may want to play around with different effective lengths in order to find an ideal ground bearing. So this is just, real quick, a, a simple spreadsheet. All it does is take the inputs that you enter and do the calculations for you, first in the soil bearing method and the mat strength method, to arrive at your ground bearing pressure, as well as allowable bending stress in the mat and shear stress in the mat. Um, my audio connection has been lost. Can everyone hear, still hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you right now. Oh, OK. Um, so I want to take a quick look real quick um, at the spreadsheet that I just showed you. 
Now this is for the 11350 11 accident in Brazil. And the reason I take a second out to show this to you is because this is not particularly difficult in my opinion. I think this is something that every crane company that is using hardwood mats uh, should be able to come up with on their own. A simple spreadsheet that will modify um, basic variables like allowable ground burn pressure and tell you immediately with visual feedback, are you within an acceptable limit? So I changed the ground burn to below 3,000 and obviously I'm not okay there. Change it back to 3,500 and I'm back to normal. And the assumed effective length that I mentioned earlier, that can be a lot of trouble to go through every single possible effective length to try and find the one that's ideal for you. So this quickens the process a little bit. See, so yeah, oops, let's do 16. So we exceeded our bending stress there, but we're still good on ground burning pressure. So um, just a quick little look at a tool that I think isn't very complicated, but can greatly enhance your lift planning abilities and make your lift planners' lives easier because they don't have to go through these steps every single time. So now quickly back to PowerPoint. Oh, did I go black again? Yeah, you did. Okay. So why I'm doing this. Okay. So I'm just going to go over real quick the, the various calculations you might be asked to do for ground burning pressure. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on outrigger pads because I, they, they don't really apply as well to this uh, set of equations. Um, basically, if, if if your manufacturer says that you're within limits and you divide your output by your square feet, I think you're all right. It doesn't really, as long as your mats are in good condition, not deformed, um, these, these equations won't help you out much there. Um, but one thing I want to point out, as I mentioned, I started out in this without really having much of a background in it. And I didn't know certain things um, that I did not see scrutinized when I turned in early lift plans. and. To be honest, I still don't see scrutinized today. Um, so, for example, one of the very first critical lifts I ever did, um, in preparation for this, I looked back on some of my plans that I've done in the past, and there were quite a few um, before I really realized that tie rods don't necessarily transfer load between timbers as efficiently as we might like. Um, that in this situation, if you have an outrigger pad in the middle of a, a 4x12 mat, let's say, that's four timbers, you're really only bearing on the center two. Um, not much is being, not a measurable amount or appreciable amount is being transferred to the outer ones. Um, and if you recall from the equations that I ran through, one of the most important things is cantilever length as far as bending stress. When you have a small outrigger pad, you have a long cantilever arm before you get to the end of the mat. Uh, so you reach your bending stress very, very quickly. Now, something that obviously helps us in this situation is transition mats. Um, a lot of times it's steel. A lot of my early lift plans had steel mats on top of wood mats. Transferring the weight across all four timbers. Um, and the reason I bring these up is because this essentially turns it into a cantilever situation that is not as small as the actual width of the outrigger pad. So you're getting a lot less bending stress. You're able to use more of the mat. Um, and get your ground bearing pressure lower. Went a little farther. So as I said, I'm now working for Buckner and we are a crawler frame company. It's really what we specialize in. So that's what a lot of my stuff has been written specifically for. Um, this example right here is a model of the LR11000, which I mentioned before, on a hypothetical one foot by four foot by 30 foot mat. We find that those fit better or best under the 11,000 you barely have any space in between. Um, just showing an example of the actual track bearing width and the cantilever length of the mat. Now I'm going to do an example of the calculations with the, uh, the setup that I just showed you. This is the same LR11000 lifting a 228,000 pound load at a radius of 198 feet with a capacity of 344,000 pounds and a fully loaded tray. Uh, so the actual gross weight of the machine is just about 3.1 million pounds, if you see it right there, if you're not familiar with Lycon. Um, so I showed you this graph before, and I didn't really mention a whole lot about what it meant or what, what, what's behind it. Um, 
And I'm going to take you real quick to the example of the 11350. So earlier I, I calculated what the actual ground burning pressure would be beneath the 11350. Uh, these are the same numbers that I entered in before. And I mentioned that when you are assuming the effective length of the mat, um, it's an iterative process because you're just making up a number between zero and the length of your mat and finding one that works. You have to redo the calculations every single time. Well, that's, that can take some time for us, but for a machine, it's significantly faster. So in this case, all we need to do is hit analyze once our information has been entered and give it some time. Um, it goes through quite a few calculations, and I'll explain um, some of those in a moment as soon as we get our results. So what we're seeing here is along the bottom, we're showing the effective length of the mat at any point between not zero, but actually it's just slightly more than the width of the crawler track. There's no point in calculating ground barrier pressure for an effective mat length less than the crawler track. And then all the way up to the 20 foot uh, full length of the mat. On the left hand side, you see your bending stress and your shear stress in pounds per square inch. And on the far right side, the ground bearing pressure on uh, pounds per square foot. Now up near the top, you'll see the maximum allowable, and that is scaled properly to line up with all three maximum allowable values. So you get a clear picture of what's going on at every single effective net length. And the center, the, 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 the area in the center, the green zone, um, is essentially your safe area where the effective length at that particular location works out to be an acceptable ground grain pressure, bending stress, and shear stress. Um, now there's additional information at the bottom, uh, just below, if, if, if anyone can't read it, it says the smallest uh, effective length is available at 12.0 feet, and then explains what the values are at that point. Uh, that is essentially the highest ground bearing pressure that will still, it falls below 4,000, which is the allowable, and still satisfies all of the conditions. Uh, the second row is the lowest ground bearing pressurable pressure, giving you the longest effective length. So in that case, you're maxing out one of your values for either bending or shear, and I have yet to run into a, a situation where it's actually shear. It's almost always bending um, and giving you the lowest ground bearing pressure available. Now, if you're stuck in a situation like I was where they would only give you a certain amount um, outside the edge of the crawler tracks, if your um, bearing width falls, your, I'm sorry, effective length due to the bearing width falls within that green zone, then you're fine. You don't have to worry. Um, now the third line is pretty important because what we're essentially doing is when we use the two different methods, the uh, mat, mat length based on soil bearing capacity and mat length based on um, mat strength, we're coming at the calculation in two different directions. One essentially maxes out the ground bearing pressure while keeping the other uh, values lower and the other maxes out the bending stress in order to get a low ground bearing pressure. So um, it doesn't really tell us about, uh, enough about what the soil can really withstand. So when these values are calculated, and I'm going to jump back to the Excel spreadsheet real quick, you find the load applied to one mat. Now it's the same in both situations because it is based on the information coming out of the crane. Imagine if you have an outrigger jack on an RT. It's going to be the same no matter what method you're using. So and in this case, it's just the calculated area under the crawler pushing into the mat times the ground through the track bearing pressure. So if this is our example for the 11350, the load we're applying to one single mat is 188,000 pounds, but that doesn't tell us what the mat can withstand. So one of the larger iterative processes going on in the background is this calculator takes the load going into the mat and increases it slowly and slowly until you eventually reach a state where you cannot go any further and you've maxed out the amount of allowable weight into the mat and soil combination. So here at the bottom we reached that at 222,000 pounds. Um, the current scenario, as I said before, is 188,000. So sorry about that. Um, we're putting in 84.69% of the allowable load into that mat soil combination. Um, that's why we end up with over here, you can see 1.476 million calculations executed in 12 seconds. So that's what took a little while. Um, any questions real quick about how that works? 
No? Okay. Uh, so this is the actual report that goes into the lift plans. Um, real quick, I want to point out that uh, it's, it's, it's a dull, boring graph, I suppose, to, to most people. But uh, one of the things I've added in just to keep things a little bit more interactive is you can see this link here at the bottom, and it was also available here. So any customer that receives a lift plan with one of these can go to that website. And what it will do is it will take that same amount of time again and calculate the results all over again, and you'll get the same result every time, um, giving the same back information back, but also allowing them to hover over at any point in any effective length that they so choose to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, so essentially from 6 feet to 20 feet, everything is calculated in hundredths of a foot increments to find out really what's going on at that exact moment. So a customer may be willing to say, well, we only want to give you 10 feet of effective mat length, but maybe we'll raise our ground bearing pressure or improve our ground conditions until we reach that point so that we're not stressing out our mats because they look a little old or worn or anything uh, really that they might decide. So that's the purpose behind this is you can get an idea of what the mat is doing at any point. Now, getting beyond the calculators, this is something that I see a lot that I, I have never done a lift plan with a crawler crane where somebody asked me, are you using hard ground numbers or soft ground numbers? And for experts who've been doing this a while, that's, that's a no-brainer to, to ask something like that, but I also don't see it in a lot of professional lift plans uh, specified at all. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the difference in the hard ground versus soft ground numbers, and I'll show you in Lycon, is that when you're on a hard surface such as a hardwood mat, you can only really contact that mat with so much width of your crawler track. In the case of the 11,000, it's 1.8 meters. Now, according to Liebherr, uh, if you fill in with some kind of crushed gravel or rock or stone, which we do often uh, in order to get our bearing pressure lower, you assume a wider, basically the full bearing width of the track. And this applies too to the full bearing length. With the 9.6 meters, is as much as we're allowed to utilize for a hard surface, such as hardwood mats. The 9.8 meters is for a soft ground surface, um, such as what the 11350 was on down in Brazil. Obviously, it wasn't enough to help, but that does help spread out the ground bearing pressure a little bit. So I guess what I'm getting at is I'm going to go through the comparison, but I think that it's something that always needs to be specified. And if you're reviewing a lift plan, as I said, I've never been asked this question. Um, even back when I didn't make it evident what I was doing. Uh, this is something for a crawler crane that really needs to come up uh, under review because this is just a quick comparison, and all these numbers are from, for the Manitowoc numbers, they are from the Manitowoc ground bearing pressure calculator, uh, showing the difference in bearing area when you go from a hardwood surface to a dirt surface where the tracks can sink in a little bit, or hard, hardwood mats with some crushed gravel on top. Um, as you get into, into larger cranes, they tend to flatten out a little bit in the tracks. Uh, the LR11000 has barely any difference at all. So uh, something to be aware of. And here is, I'm going to show you two scenarios. They're actually the same scenario as far as the lift is concerned. But Lycon allows you to transfer back and forth from hard ground to soft ground numbers. This is the hard ground um, and then soft. And since we're using a tray in this case, the ground bearing or the uh, center of gravity is centered almost nearly on the center pin of the crane, so we're pretty balanced, and it doesn't really change much as we go over the side or over the toe or over the front of the uh, crawlers. So that's why I picked out this scenario. So this comparison is on the top, you're shown the bare 11,000 in that situation just tracks on hardwood mats and the additional stress that it goes through, which I'll explain on the next slide. Uh, so you're only allowed 14.6 feet of effective mat length, and you've got 3,600 pounds per square foot. Uh, that's assuming as much mat length as you can before you reach your bending stress limit. Now, on the bottom is the soft ground numbers. You're allowed 15.64 feet of effective. I'm sorry about that. 15.64 feet of effective mat length. It significantly reduces your ground bearing pressure. Um, so it, adding a quick little layer between the mats and the tracks can greatly enhance your ground bearing pressure and your overall usage of the mat. 
um, which is why I think it needs to be better scrutinized on lift plans that don't specify which numbers are you using. Um, now this explanation right here shows why it changes. Um, the top is the hard ground numbers again, and if you see the load applied to one mat, since you have a more narrow track bearing width, you're still applying to four foot of the mat beneath the tracks, but you're a little bit more narrow and your pressures are a little higher. So you're putting more of a load into the mat by about 4,000 pounds. Um, this also changes your cantilever length of the mat. You end up with a shorter cantilever, or sorry, longer cantilever with the hard run numbers because you have a more narrow bearing width again. So, Jim? Um, yes? Jim, yeah, this yes. is Mike. So, so uh, to, to help you, you're able to you're putting material, either sand or uh, crushed rock, between the track and the mat itself in the in the mid layer, uh, not underneath the mat. Yes, let me, let me go back to one slide that would make it a little bit more clear, I suppose. Um, if you see right here, the, the curve of the edge of the crawler tracks. Essentially from here to here, that's the width that they'll allow you on a hard ground because it is just a completely flat portion of the track and the curves at the end don't really touch anything. But yeah. if you're on a, a, a softer surface such as dirt, you're, you will sink in a little bit and the pressure is applied better through the full length of the, or the full width of the track. Is that a yeah. better explanation? Yeah, and um, would uh, like a two inch, three inch layer crushed rock, is that a, uh, maybe a better distributor of uh, pressure? What, what's, your, what's your experience? Well, the answer that I've been given from Liebherr, um, this, this came up early on because I was genuinely curious about how this works. Um, essentially, it, it, it does allow the, the tracks to sink in a little bit. Like if you think about um, walking on, so, okay, here's, my, here's an analogy that might work. A, a woman walking in heels on concrete versus uh, mud her feet are going to sink in more and more of her foot area is going to contact the ground so the actual area contacting the ground will have less pressure because she still weighs the same. In both hard and soft ground scenarios the crane weighs the same amount, it's just that more of the track is sinking in and contacting the ground. Right. Uh, is, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but, okay. and I just was curious, have you found a material that works better in the distribution process? whether sand or uh, uh, crushed rock, uh, five eighths minus or, you know, inch and a quarter minus or, you know, any, anything that helps? In, in the scenarios that we've had to deal with this, crushed rock is what we've gone with and um, we have no direct way of measuring, I suppose, what is going on beneath the mats. Um, what I can say is that it allowed us in a situation where, oops, I apologize for that, can, consistently happening. I've never seen that before. Um, anyway, uh, it allowed us to get below an allowable ground bearing pressure limit for a site. Um, yep. And as I said, according to Libra, this is a safe procedure to do because you really are spreading out the pressure over a larger surface area. Um, right. I just had no means to measure what was really going on beneath the mats. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now, where was I? Now, one of the things I mentioned I wanted to talk about in this presentation was, um, I don't want to use the word gripes, but complaints or issues that I have with certain manufacturers, even though we own mostly, almost all, Lee Bear cranes, uh, one of the issues that I've been having with um, planning for this sort of uh, information is that for the 1400, 1600, and 1750, uh, it doesn't change the given allowable bearing area. Uh, in this example, you're looking at a 1400, which the bearing area is given as 25.6 by 3.4 feet per track. And for anyone not familiar with looking at Lycon, the numbers above the track, the 40, that's not in parentheses, that is assuming a hard ground surface, the 29 is assuming a soft ground. Well, if, you're, if you have the, a crane that is the same weight, and your pressure is changing, then clearly, clearly your area must be changing. So um, I've asked for this information, what is the actual allowable bearing width and length of the track in soft ground conditions? Uh, they won't give it. 
I'm not sure if it's not available. I just haven't gotten a solid answer. So that's one thing that would make things a little bit more clear if, if we could explain to customers why we're using a lower pressure than what it says because we're really using more area for the same amount of weight. Now, one more thing that I I've, I've, I've haven't seen as, as scrutinized as I, I guess I would like or, or not as detailed as, as I'd like is um, load case scenarios, what's going on with, with the load, not just uh, a ground bearing pressure given for the moment that you're in the set position with the crane and the load is still a foot off the ground. Uh, that was all that's been asked of me for quite some time until I realized uh, quite early that there was more to it than that. Obviously, uh, you're not just setting over the side with a crawler, you're swinging, uh, you may want to boom up while you're swinging over the corner. Um, but this was an early example I did for a different company. The names have been blurred out to protect the innocent. Um, but I'm seeing it more and more though. More and more people are aware that um, potentially your ground bearing pressure situation is worse when you're boomed up high with no load on the hook. However, I'm not seeing a, a request for it in most cases. In the scenario I gave you earlier where the company would only allow us two feet outside the crawler tracks, um, they didn't ask anything about without a load on the hook. They weren't concerned. All they cared about was what, what was going on the moment that the vessel was in position and the crane was still attached. So the so, whole question then, Jim, is uh, c can we, and we often do see some uh, applied uh, loads to outriggers in, this, in these cases where the crane's just been set up, it, it's boomed up, minimum uh, boom length, and then swing around to get oriented to a load and all of a sudden you're at your highest load values. So, um, can you hear me because I got the audio connection restored again? Yeah, just just okay. broke back in. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to get to the way that I, I foresee myself doing this now and I, I foresee this coming up with our 11,000 because um, one of our customers is get, getting quite a bit more sophisticated about the kind of questions they ask um, about what's going on beneath the ground or beneath the mats as the, the load is um, being handled. So uh, as, you, as you mentioned, some of the highest can be when you're boomed up, boomed up high with a short main boom and you've got no load, you can be completely back heavy. Um, right? it, took, it took a long, long time before I heard that request from somebody asking for uh, no load on the hook. So this, this monstrosity was what happened when somebody knew what they were asking. They asked for the ground bearing pressure for several combinations of a crane for every single load weight for the minimum radius and the maximum radius. And if you look down in the right hand corner, you can see sheet 001 of 085. Uh, this was, there was a lot of misery that went into this DWG file. And again, the, the names have been changed to protect the guilty in this case. And it, it was a mess. Um, but it, it was interesting that somebody really was looking for every single scenario. And the really unfortunate thing about this and what drove me to, to, to look into something different was this page, the summary page, which I probably should not have put in there because as soon as somebody sees that that's 85 pages, they probably looked at this page and assumed everything else was okay. I could have probably colored with crayons in the remainder page, remaining pages without anyone bothering to look at it. And, um, so there was a lot of work that you know, produced results, however, it, it may not have been scrutinized or looked into in the same way as you might um, expect. So this is something different that I've come up with that I foresee being very, very valuable with a crane the size of the 11,000 because it, it's going to go through so many situations where the questions are going to come up. You know, we, that, that is a three million pound machine in its, in its current state. What is it doing to the ground right this second? So um, I'm going to show this video real quick, and it's going to loop several times, so we'll get to see what's going on, um, and I'll explain it as it's looping. Now, up in the left-hand corner, what you see is, is the Lycon screen, and I've got a 1750 in SW configuration with 138 feet of main boom, 161 of left and legit. Uh, 147,000 pounds on the hook at an 80 foot radius. And if you're not familiar with Lycon, what you can see in the center of the Lycon screen is the red line is pointing towards the front of the crane where the boom is at. 
And just to the left of that, you see a little uh, geometric shape with a green dot showing you where your center of gravity is. So as this crane slews 180, 180 degrees from over one crawler track to the opposite side, you see what is going on with the ground brain pressure every degree of the way. Um, on the right hand side, you see a slightly earlier version of the charts that I've shown you before. For the same basic principle. As you exceed or you approach your maximum allowable, you realize that you're exceeding the accepted ground brain pressure conditions. And it's about to go red. See, I, I programmed in so it, it visually would strike you as red. Um, and I set up this scenario intentionally to exceed the allowables just to kind of better visualize what's happening. You're, you're perfectly fine and your lowest value going over the side of the crane. As you stay at the same radius, uh, you go over the toe, you exceed your values right there, and then you're okay again over the front, but you're still pretty close, and then you go over the toe again and you exceed it. So um, the reason I came up with this is after I did the 85 pages of ground brain pressure, which I'm sure got tossed away, I thought to myself, what would somebody who really wants to scrutinize this be more apt to really delve into something that they can visually see like this that is showing the steps in the process or a long-winded report that it may be extremely cryptic to them if they're not sure what they're reading. So um, my intentions are, in, the, in this case, as I mentioned, all it's doing is turning 180 degrees. Um, in the future, I can do the same thing with no load on the hook, slowly picking up the load, maybe a thousand pounds at a time, then slowing into place, maybe booming out to a farther radius, lowering the, lowering the piece with the weight coming off about a thousand pounds at a time, and then the empty condition, the crane booming back up, swinging back to you know, its next task. So a, a full explanation of what's going on beneath the crawler tracks as the crane is going through the motions, rather than just one or two scenarios that might not be telling the whole story. So I will shut that off. So I just want to summarize um, finally that this is my final slide. Um, things that I think all lift planners need to consider when evaluating ground bearing pressure and what lift plan reviewers need to consider when they're asking their questions. Are all timbers of the mat being loaded when under an outrigger? As I pointed out, the tie rods are not necessarily made to transfer load between the timbers and a mat. Um, you may be only loading one or two timbers, so that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, is the full length of the mat considered as being effective? Um, I'll tell you one story, or may, I'll make it very brief. One of the very first lift plans I ever did was for a triple nine, and I knew nothing about crane mats at that time, and I assumed the full four by twenty and for 80 square feet of ground bearing area for that mat. Nothing happened, um, there was no accident, but when I looked back and did the actual calculations, I was definitely over the allowable ground bearing pressure by a little bit. Obviously there is a safety factor built into that, but if somebody's telling you that we're gonna use the full length of this four by 80 foot mat, or I mean four by 20 foot mat, and all 80 square feet, there needs to be some questions. Um, specifically, what are the bearing and shear stresses in that mat? And if you're not using the full length, that should still be explained. What um, effective length is bearing into the soil? Um, and then as far as what I just showed you, have all worst case scenarios been considered? Unloaded over the, over the back. Um, load as it's just being set down. Load as uh, the crane is still in set position and it's off the hook. Um, the worst case swing angles. And one of the great things about that video that I showed you is that a lot of the calculators like Matt's walk for crawler cranes will tell you the exact angle that is the worst case scenario. I know that the Grove uh, calculator online for uh, RTs and all terrains will tell you the exact moments that are the worst case and point that out. In, Le in Lycon with Lieber, you just have to kind of swing back and forth until you find where it maximizes. So it's, it's not entirely clear where is the worst case scenario with Lycon and that would be easy for someone to hide. It, it wouldn't be difficult for a person to say, yes, here is the worst case swinging over the toe of the crawlers, when in reality, they're going to swing another 10 degrees and be in an even worse case. So another issue that I have with some of the, um, I, I may have just lost audio again on my back. Uh, 
yeah, you're back. Can hear you, Jim. Okay. Um, the one, one, one more uh, gripe or complaint I have, or a wish that manufacturers would be more transparent around, is the ground bearing pressure in the erection phase of the crane. Um, just recently, we actually had a customer ask about this, and I could not find an answer without consulting Liebherr. Um, and this was in a scenario where we're lifting over the side with the outriggers for additional support in order to raise a very long main boom and luffing jig combination. And the answer I got back wasn't particularly satisfactory. What they told me was, in this case, the maximum pressure output by these outriggers could be anywhere between 80,000 and 200,000 pounds. And that's a pretty big range. So if, that, if that's the most satisfactory answer I can get, then there's something wrong. And we need to press manufacturers to release more information about what's really going on uh, under the crawlers or under the outriggers when you are erecting that claim. Um, and finally, if you're reviewing or creating a lift plan and you're working with a crawler crane, uh, you need to ask a question or specify a hard ground or soft ground numbers being used. Um, I think if, if, if these things are addressed a little bit more and a little bit more scrutinized, uh, we're going to have a safer industry overall. So, yeah. Okay, the, uh, some, some very good information. While we're on that slide, and we're going to go to the uh, question slide here, uh, if you've got nothing, um, would, would you encourage folks to stay with the hard ground condition and their original analysis? and that maybe being the worst case, um, it, it, I mean, is there if they if they've got some some ways to to mitigate the, the loading, uh, is it best to, best to really go with their hard hard ground numbers and those restricted dimensions uh, of the width and the length first? Is that is that would that be your recommendation? What I always do. Um, and I do a lot of preliminary lift planning before we even have jobs available um, or you know, during the bidding phase. And what I, I will always give the customers first is the hard ground numbers. And with the explanation that if these are too high, there are things we can do to mitigate. So I always begin there first. Yeah. And a lot of the time, um, depending on the size of the crane, um, it's not that big of a difference. I mean, it, may, it will make some difference, but you're usually still within allowable levels. Um, I showed that slide at the table comparing the bearing area between hard and soft for several cranes of various sizes, and the smaller Manitowocs had a much more significant difference. However, they, gen they, they tend to be lighter and not as big of an issue with ground bearing pressure, but still, those cranes are more troublesome when it comes to that. Um, the thing that I've been taught since coming to Buckner, where we're more focused on crawlers as opposed to uh, all trains and RTs like the company I used to work for is that it, it, it all it can do is make it more safe and protect your mats. So right. if if you're if you're unable to do so, you know, any, unable to put down some kind of soft layer to cushion the, the crawler tracks and protect your mats a little bit, then yes, definitely use the hard ground numbers. And I mean that's where I start anyway. But it, it, if it's necessary, it, it's it's just a mitigating factor that you can work in there if you need to. Okay, great. Okay. Jonah, do you have some questions that folks have typed in we can share with Jim? And I can put a screen up. We can maybe uh, log along with Jim as he might respond. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm going to toss the screen your way, Mike. Okay. And we can start with the question that just came in. It's from Robert. And he asks, as a crane service provider, who is responsible for calculating the ground bearing pressure if I'm on a job site for only one or two days. If I provide this, do I risk becoming the controlling entity of ground conditions considering the new OSHA regulations? Well, I am on site. Now, are you, are you referring to, well, I guess you can't ask him. Um, I guess the question that I, I foresaw coming up was how do you determine allowable ground bearing pressure? And then and whoever comes up with that is definitely uh, liable for any inaccuracies. Um, who is responsible for calculating allowable ground bearing pressure? To me that I think falls on the, the, the crane company providing, um, and for example, we do some bear rentals and in no case will I do ground bearing pressure for a bear rental um, because that becomes essentially their responsibility. 
So uh, I'm not as uh, I'm Jim, not as Jim. If I can t uh, jump in here um, from the you're familiar with the 1926 1400 document, I'm sure to you know ad nauseum. But the uh, controlling entity is responsible to provide the uh, information to the crane group, whether that's the owner, user, lift director, etc. The controlling entity, by in OSHA's eyes, is responsible to provide the um, allowable ground bearing pressure information, so then they can then respond based on mat needs, crane sizing, and placements, and all that. So, if I, I would, uh, I know you know the service company might only be on site for a day or two, but OSHA's kind of exp um, already handed off the you know or ensured that that responsibility sits with the people that are most familiar with the ground uh, for a new crane group that might show up for a day or two. Um, the, the, the controlling entity is the party um, that is accountable to provide that. Whenever the question is asked by the service group, what is the allowable G, you know, GBP, what, uh, they have to turn around and give an answer. And if, it's, if the answer is, uh, if it's too soft, um, they, the, the service group may need to say, well, you need, you need to prepare a crane pad for us to at least get us up to this value, then our mats or our matting process will work. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're going to sink the crane in the ground here on the first go. That's, that, that is something I've run into where people will uh, not answer our, our constant questions of what is the allowable for the site. So the best yeah. that we can come up with or respond back with is, this is what we will stay beneath. You need to prepare the ground for that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this question isn't really up my alley. I'm not as familiar with, I guess, the responsibilities and legalities. I stick to the technical stuff for now. Right. Good, good, good reply. Okay, uh, any other questions, Jonah? Yeah, here, if you guys have time, there's a couple more. Um, this one comes in from Alec. He wants to know what the allowable level of variance between two tracks is. Allowable level of variance. Um, does he mean as far as angle, like setup, if, if a crane is not level, or variance as in difference between the bearing pressures beneath the two? I'm not sure what he means by variance. Um, yeah, there isn't anything more specific than that. If you could speak on both points, that would probably answer his question. Well, I know load charts are generally restricted to a few, uh, a certain limit of how far off tilt you can be or how off level you can be and have the load charts still be applicable. Um, now as far as variance between the tracks, I mean you can have you can have a vast difference if you're lifting over one side of the, 90 degrees over the side of the crawlers, you're, the, the crawler you're lifting over is going to be much, much more heavily loaded than the one in the rear. Um, Mike, how, how would you take that question? What do you think he's referring to? Well, uh, allowable level of variance, I you know, I don't think that um, I, I. The only thing that comes to mind is that you may have a ground bear, allowable ground bearing pressures in one zone or area. But let's just say it's 3,500 over here and 4,000 psf over there. Oh, and so, I am um, That may be the direction of the question, um, but uh, we would just simply have to calculate based on the the um, the lowest psf available to us and go forward from there. We, the, um, how much difference they are isn't as big a deal as what's the minimum number. That, I, would agree. I, would look at. I would agree with that. Um, I recently looked at some plans for a plant where they had a geo, a geo uh, technical survey for all areas of the plants. There were well over 100 boring sites for uh, determining you know, what the soil compaction was and they gave different ground bearing pressures for different units in the plant, however, there was no point where they said um, 10 feet in this direction you're this and 10 feet in that direction you're that, where a crane would sit on both. And in that case, I would go with what you suggested, the lower, it just makes much more sense and it's yep. to play it safe. Right, yep, okay. So I hope, I hope that answers the question he was trying to ask. And if not, he would. Uh, I would ask that he would email in a more specific question after the uh, webinar, and then we can work on getting a you know getting a good uh, answer to him. So, mm -hmm. um, Tony, you got another question? Yeah, I think there is one more here, and this is actually from Steve Miles, who he's a consultant and a trainer for ITI. 
Um, Steve was wondering, would your, the method you, you showed us, Jim, would that be appropriate for a crib runaway for a gantry system? And his example is a four-post hydraulic system. You know, well, let me let me jump back real quick to this. Oh, I'm not on screen. Well, I yeah, I can toss it your way. Okay. Show my screen. Now, the way I would interpret it if I was asked to do this, and I haven't been yet, although we do use gantries on an occasion, is let's say the track of the gantry was the width of the crawler track in this scenario you're looking at right now, I would treat it the same way. You have an effective bearing width of that track for the gantry versus the cantilevered arms and the full length of the mat is how I would treat it. Now, since I haven't done that before, I would definitely consult with somebody to ensure that that's the safest way to do it, but that's the approach I would take first. Yep. Yep, good idea. Yeah, because the and you have the ability on a gantry system to uh, trolley uh, potentially, uh, some have trolley ability left and right while you're also rolling forward and aft. So you have some corner loading options or opportunities there that mm -hmm. could be, we might have to restrict the load location for uh, the left and right trolley uh, uh, spans and uh, limit them to no more than three feet off center line for CG of load in the in the in the horizontal uh, between between your posts and then uh, wherever the length of the, the run is that it, it would need to have a stopping point that wouldn't exceed your mat support so yeah, and the way the way I look at it um, is that the image that I j just had on screen um, versus the gantry system on a map or versus the uh, the outrigger pad with a transition transitional steel mat all it really is is your effective bearing width versus the full length of the mat and figuring out what your bending stress is um, right it's essentially the same principle yep okay good is that it Jonah yeah I think we can wrap it up there um, we're, we just hit the hour mark, which is great. We want to respect everyone's time. Just before we sign off, I got to say, and Jim probably doesn't want everybody to know this, but I got to say we're really, really, really lucky to have him on with us. As soon as we scheduled this webinar, um, right after that, his workload with special projects and, and things um, really picked up. So he, he was really burning the candle kind of on both ends to make sure he could uh, get all the the information that he shared with everybody today. So I got to say thank you, Jim, and it was awesome. Um, great response, great feedback from some of the uh, comments I got on this end, and I yeah, I just can't thank you enough. Well, I appreciate I I, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to do this. I should have put up a, a slide. I don't know if we could pull one up with my email address in case anyone has any questions, um, or put up a link on the the uh, site when this show goes up. Sure, yeah, I can grab that and we can decide which email you want to use so you're not <laughs> overloaded, but um, we can we can figure that out off the air and we can get it up there for sure. Sounds and good. you can send, a, um, Jonah, you can send out uh, Jim's email contact information to all the participants by uh, a blast email, is that right? Yeah, that's possible as well. So however we want to uh, take care of that. Um, okay, and yeah, we can make let me sure ask your question. Let me ask uh, Jim. The uh, availability uh, is what are you, what are you doing with your software? Are you is it public source? Is it by uh, a rights and hire with Buckner or what? I mean, what's the status of it? Is it is it in house restricted software package that's used for Buckner projects only or what? I haven't come up with an answer to that at, at the moment. I don't want to make anything that I've done publicly available for the sake of liability concerns. Um, I don't want somebody, not, not just liability, but for the, the, the sheer possibility of an accident. If somebody were to, to misunderstand or misrepresent information and pass it off as acceptable just because you have a nice looking chart that says everything's okay, I wouldn't want the risk out there of somebody potentially being injured or killed. Um, so I'm a little leery of that right now. Right. Um, Right, so I'm, I'm kind of keeping everything that I've done to myself for the moment. Yep. Okay. And if it would become available downstream, you'd be able to 
I mean, it, it, you may opt to decide someday in the future to provide some uh, uh, field field available software that folks could at least get some good ideas on what they have for potentials. So, um, but I guess you could, you know, we'll all know that in the future if it ever rolls out. So, right. we really appreciate it. This is phenomenal, uh, very good information, and this is helping bring together the ground bearing pressure uh, webinars we've had in the past to what a, a daily planner uh, has to evaluate and, and consider all the elements. And it's uh, been extremely informative, and we really appreciate your time very, very much, and look forward to having you work with us on a future webinar uh, downstream if you uh, are so inclined. There's a number of subjects I'm sure you're uh, savvy with and can help us uh, help educate the rest of our industry with. So we appreciate your, uh, your time and dedication to our industry. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to sign off now, and we want to uh, thank everyone for uh, the attendance and uh, participation, and look forward to having you with us on a future webinar. So we'll conclude now, and uh, we hope everybody has a great week and weekend, and uh, stay safe, and uh, make sure we've uh, covered all our bases when we're doing our planning. Uh, this is Mike Parnell signing off, and uh, Jim, thanks, and John, we appreciate your help, buddy. And uh, take care. We'll talk to everybody soon.